of the three prelates sent from Rome to negotiate the Concordat, Cardinal Consalvi and Monsignor Spina were very enlightened men. Father Caselli, who acted with them in the capacity of advisor on all matters of form, cases of conscience, and pontifical protocol, was a simple and loyal man wrapped up in the theological questions which had been the study of his life. Cardinal Consalvi, without openly blaming the decree of the Council of Trent, which enforces celibacy on the priests, did not in conversation reject the idea of allowing them to marry. He did not prescribe theatrical performances and, as he himself said, would have had no objection to be present at the representation of a moral play on the stage. These remarks of his, which in no way bound him, were a trifling concession to the free-thinking spirit with which he was besieged in Paris. Whilst speaking as a man free from prejudices, he could only act in accordance with the spirit of the church. He only spoke so freely of the marriage of priests because the question had been eliminated, either in deference to the views of the first consul or because the latter did not wish to complicate negotiations, which were sufficiently thorny without it. The Concordat is perhaps the most important act of Napoleon's government. After having considered it in relation to politics and in its general effect, there would be something wanting to the appreciation of this great work if the part played in it by the personal feeling of the head of the state were to be passed over in silence. Some people have thought that, in the eyes of Napoleon, religious belief was but a superstition consecrated by time, and that in reestablishing the Catholic religion, he only made use of it as a tool of his ambition, without any, in any way, considering the social influence of religion. Those who spoke thus were ignorant of the fact that Bonaparte was sincerely religious. I may add, a true Catholic. His detestation of the free-thinking cynicism which preaches contempt for religion, which was considered by him, on the contrary, as the basis of morality and decency, was as great as his horror for the bigotry which fetters human intelligence. If, in the course of private conversation or in the discussions into which he was drawn by his active brain and in considering the history of the Catholic Church in its various vicissitudes, he had expressed certain opinions blaming the excesses committed in the name of religion by its ministers. What a mistake it is to conclude that he was blind to the civilizing influence of Christianity or that he was an unbelieving and skeptical philosopher. His respect for the doctrines of the gospel was the outcome of his convictions and his early training. Witness the religious thoughts which the church bell of Rouillé heard in the garden of La Malmaison, awoke within him and his recourse during his last months at St. Helena to the consolations and succor of religion. In reestablishing the Roman Catholic religion in France, he filled the void which its absence left in the state. But at the same time, he obeyed the dictates of his religious instincts. The first measure was the creation of a ministry of public worship. The direction of this ministry was entrusted to Portalis, who at first assumed the title of Counselor of State, charged with the matters concerning public worship, and shortly afterwards that of minister. Portalis was a learned lawyer and a flowery orator, gentle, conciliatory in character. He has been accused, and perhaps with reason, of too great flexibility, but in the functions which it was his to perform, this quality was an advantage rather than a drawback. He was a good man of the kind defined by Cicero as vir bonus et decendi peritus. His philanthropy was as great as his learning and his eloquence. Monsignor Spina, who had been created colonel after the signing of the Concordat, remained in Paris as a chargé d'affaires. He was replaced by Cardinal Caparra, who had been appointed legate a uh, la Terry. A cardinal who arrived in Paris in the month of September was not presented to the First Consul until the 9th of April following. 
the Archbishop of Lyon was sent to Rome with the title of ambassador. He was the uncle of the first consul, the maternal grandmother of Napoleon, having married Monsieur Fesch on her second marriage. Monsieur Fesch was captain of one of the Swiss regiments with which the Republic of Genoa maintained in Corsica at the time of her domination. Cardinal Caprera was the issue of this second marriage. Abbe Fesch had left holy orders at the commencement of the revolution and had performed laical functions in Italy. He res resumed the priest's gown after the 18th Brumaire. Patronized by his nephew, he rapidly rose to the highest dignities in the church. He was appointed Archbishop of Lyon in 1801 and promoted to the Cardinalate two years later. He went to Rome to replace Monsieur Cacot, French Chargé d'Affaires, when the Concordat was signed. Monsieur de Chateaubriand, author of The Genius of Christianity, who had returned from the emigration before the amnesty, had been presented by Monsieur de Fontaine, his intimate friend, to Madame Bacciocci, sister of the First Consul, and to his brother, Lucien Bonaparte. Brother and sister declared to Monsieur de Chateaubriand, under their protection, the publication of the genius of Christianity at the moment when Catholicism had been reestablished in France produced a great sensation. Religious ideas were spreading all the more rapidly that for so long they had been repressed. No more favorable opportunity could have been found for the publication of this work, and it was received with favor by the first consul. The protection of Madame Bacciocci, but more especially the satisfaction felt by the first consul at the publication of a work which seconded his opinions and gave assistance to the concordat decided him to give the author a mark in his favor in appointing him secretary of legation at the Holy See. The evacuation of Egypt was keenly felt by the first consul. The tragical death of Clibert was a disaster, for if he had lived in France, might have retained this important conquest. The signature of the preliminaries of London was a powerful diversion from the unfortunate issue of the Egyptian campaign. The object pursued by the first consul since his accession to power was realized. His first step had been an appeal to the King of England to assist in a pacification which should be satisfactory to the interests of the two countries. This appeal had not been listened to. A second negotiation had been attempted, but the British ministry did not think the new government sufficiently well established and these negotiations had come to nothing. Whilst the continental peace was being signed at Luneville, Messrs. Pitt, Dunda, and Grenville, fiery partisans of war, believing peace with France to be inevitable, had retired to make way for a new ministry. They did not wish to incur the responsibility in the eyes of the aristocracy and commerce of England of an experiment which would show whether peace was more advantageous to these two important classes than war. The ministers who were succeeded by Addington and Hawkesbury had ordered that French fishing boats should be pursued and captured like ships of war. In answer to the communication made to Monsieur Otto, discharging the functions of French commissioner in London for the exchange of prisoners, communication of an order which violated every usage and every rule of war, Monsieur Otto declared that he had received instructions to leave England, where his stay had become useless, but that his government would not take reprisals, and that the French cruisers would abstain from any interference with fishing boats. In answer to the French commissioner's note, the new ministry repealed the order concerning the French fishermen. This abandonment of a measure which had given the war a character of savagery, quite unworthy of a civilized nation, bespoke less hostile dispositions. In the discussions which this matter provoked, the English ministry held out the prospect of a reconciliation. As a matter of fact, one month later, Monsieur Otto received a note which contained an offer to set a plenipotentiary to Paris with authority to negotiate for peace. This overture was cordially responded to by the First Consul, who accredited Monsieur Otto to receive the proposals of the English ministers and to treat preliminarily. 
Monsieur Otto was instructed that it was no ostentatious negotiations that were desired, but that the preliminary articles of a treaty of pacification should be secured. In consequence, Lord Hawkesbury handed to Monsieur Otto a synopsis written by his own hand of the terms on which England would sign the peace. These terms exacted that France and her allies should cede to England her most important colonies, Egypt and Malta. The first consul, having refused these proposals, which already previously had not been considered acceptable, Lord Hawkesbury asked the French government on what basis it was disposed to treat. Monsieur Otto made the following proposals. Egypt to be restored to the port, Malta to be dismantled and restored to the order, the island of Ceylon to be ceded to England, the Cape of Good Hope and all other establishments to be restored to France and her allies, Portugal to be maintained in her integrity. The English government haggled over these conditions, though at the same time it declared itself ready to agree as to Malta. It renounced its claim to Martinique, but desired to retain possessions of Trinidad, which was a Spanish possession, and of Tobago, a French possession, and in this case proposed that the Dutch possessions of Demerara, Esquibo, and Berbice should be declared free ports, or as an alternative, it offered to abandon Trinidad, but to retain the French islands of Tobago, San Lucia, together with Demeterara, Esquibo, and Berbice. These alternatives were embarrassing to the French government, for either Spain or Holland had to be sacrificed to save these powers from the loss of the important colonies which England demanded. The first consul consented to give up Tobago, but the English government refused to be satisfied with this concession, even though Monsieur Oro offered to add Curacao. At last, after six months of negotiations, the preliminaries of peace were signed. The principal conditions were that all possessions which had belonged to France and her allies should be restored to them, with the exception of Ceylon and Trinidad, that the Cape of Good Hope should be open to the trade of both nations, that Egypt should be handed over to the port, that the Republic of the Ionian Islands should be recognized, that Portugal should be maintained in her integrity, and finally, that Malta should be evacuated by the English and restored to the order, and that the power guaranteeing the independence of this island should be designated later. It was agreed upon that a Congress should be held at Amiens for the settlement of a definitive treaty in which certain points which had not been settled should be decided upon. The following reflections of Napoleon on the refusal of England to accept the peace, which he had offered her in 1800, will be considered of great interest. Number one, could the English cabinet refuse the overtures attempted by the first consul without rendering itself responsible for the miseries of war? Two, was it refusal? Was this refusal good policy? And was it in conformity with the interests of England? Three, was war then to be desired for France? Four, what were Napoleon's interests under these circumstances? Pitt refused to enter upon negotiations in the hope that by continuing the war, he would force France to recall the House of Bourbon and give Belgium back to Austria. If these two pretensions were legitimate and just, he could with justice refuse peace. But if the one as well as the other were illegitimate and unjust, he rendered his country responsible for the horrors of war. Now the Republic had been recognized by the whole of Europe. England herself had recognized it when in 1796 she invested Lord Malmesbury with full powers to treat with the Directoire. This plenipotentiary had visited Paris and Lille in turn and had negotiated with Charles Lacroix, Le Tourneur, and Marais, ministers of the Directoire. Besides, the war had not the return of the Bourbons as its object. The Belgian provinces had been ceded by the Emperor of Austria by the Treaty of Campo Formio in 1797, and England had recognized their units of France by the negotiations of Lord Malmesbury at Lille. They formed a legitimate part of the territory of the Republic. To wish to separate them from her was to usurp to rent, to dismember a recognized state. Two, was Pitt's policy 
in his matter in conformity with the interests of England? Could he reasonably hope to obtain Belgium by continuing the war? Would it not have been wiser to restore peace to the world in securing real and lasting advantages? The kings of Sardinia and of Naples, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and the Pope would have been reestablished and consulted consolidated their throats, Milan would have been assured to Austria. Holland, together with Switzerland and Genoa, would have been evacuated by the French. English influence might have extended in these countries. Egypt would have been restored to the port and malted to the order. Ceylon, the Cape of Good Hope, and Trinidad would have assured the power of England in the two Indies. What a magnificent result for the campaign of 1799. These advantages were certain. The hopes to which they were sacrificed were less likely of realization. The coalition had been victorious in 1799 in Italy and had been defeated in Switzerland. Holland and the East, France, had just changed governments. A man whose military talents and knowledge had been tested had succeeded five persons who were in feud amongst themselves and who were less than skillful. This man had been raised to power by the wish of the nation. At the mere sound of his name, the Vendée submitted and the Russians marched to recross the Vistula. Lord Grenville himself admitted that even if the French consul wished to give up Belgium, the French people would oppose any session. The object of the war was then popular in France. Berlin, Vienna, and London might deceive themselves in 1799 that the circumstances then were so new. Could English statesmen be excused for falling into the same error in 1800? It was probable that the campaign of 1800 would be favorable to France, that she would reconquer Italy, and, in fine, that even if her success were problematic, England would nonetheless be obliged to pay immense subsidies for many years. For, in order to tear Belgium from France, the reunion of Austria, Russia, and Prussia would be needed, or at least the union of one of these powers to the coalition. Now, no such result could be obtained by the campaign of 1800. The risks then of this campaign were not to be incurred. Three, the interest of the Republic was opposed to the interest of England. Had she signed peace then, she would have done so after having lost Italy. She would have retrograded as a result of one doubtful campaign. That would have been dishonoring and would have prompted all the kings to league themselves against her. All the chances of the campaign of 1800 were in her favor. The Russians had left. The Vendée was pacified. The interior factions were under restraint, and there was absolute confidence in the head of the government. The Republic could only and should only make peace after having reestablished the equilibrium of Italy. She could only play herself false and compromise her future by signing peace on any terms less advantageous than those secured at Campio Formio. War was at that time necessary to her for the maintenance of the energy and the unity of the state. Then, badly organized, the nation would have insisted upon a great reduction of taxation and the disbandment of a large portion of the army, so that two years after the war, France would have come onto the battlefield under great disadvantages. Four, Napoleon wanted needed war. The campaigns of Italy, the peace of Campo Formio, the Egyptian expedition, the 18th premier, the unanimous desire of the people to raise him to the highest point in the state, and no doubt placed him very high. A treaty of peace inferior in advantages to France to the one secured at Campio Fumio, which would have ruined all his creations in Italy, would have blasted the imagination of the French nation and would have deprived him of the force necessary for the termination of the revolution and the possibility of establishing a definitive and permanent system of government. He saw this and awaited the answer from London with impatience. The answer filled him with secret joy. The more the English oligarchy insulted the republic the more it was serving Napoleon's private interests. And he said so to his minister. We could not have had a more favorable answer. From that moment, he saw that having to deal with politicians so swayed by passion, there would be but few obstacles in the path toward the fulfillment of his destinies. Pitt, so distinguished by his parliamentary talents and his knowledge of affairs at home, was completely ignorant of what is called politics. As a general rule, England knows nothing about continental affairs, and especially about French affairs. The glory of France was carried to the highest point. All Europe was subjected to her, and Lord Grenville was obliged, in a very few months after his insulting declamations against the nation, to sign a treaty of peace, which is more advantageous to us than the peace of Campo Formio, inasmuch as it gave us Piedmont and Tuscany. But... 
for the assassin's dagger, which threw the command of the army of the East into the hands of a man who, no doubt, distinguished in many ways, was without military genius. Egypt would have been united to France forever. For both the English and the French agreed that Abercrombie would have been beaten if Claybert had lived. The port had already shown herself favorably disposed towards France in abandoning Egypt to her. How heavy a fanatic of 20 years of age weighed in the balance of the world.